Ladies and gentlemen, and friends of Asia Society Hong Kong Center, it is with great pleasure that I, as the Executive Director of Asia Society Hong Kong Center that I can welcome you tonight's gala, which features two outstanding global citizens. Dr. Jim Yong Kim, President of the World Bank Group, and Mr. Joseph Tsai, Executive Vice Chairman of Alibaba Group. We will have an opportunity to hear from them later this evening as they discuss maneuvering the world in transition. And we are very honored that we are tonight joined by Hong Kong SAR Chief Executive, Mrs. Carrie Lam. We certainly are living in a world uh, in transition, but one constant since 2012 has been Asia Society Hong Kong Center. Uh, the center's ability to bring quality and thoughtful discussions, like tonight's gala, is a great example of this. As you may be aware, uh, most of you know that this month marks the 40th anniversary of the opening up of China. The reforms has helped lift over two-thirds of a billion people out of poverty and see China emerging as a global tech and innovation leader. However, with China's rise, it has brought certain tensions. Um, we, uh, those of you who are with us in April will recall uh, that Asia Society Hong Kong Center presented uh, Professor Graham Allison's Destined for War, Can America and China Escape the, the Sudanese Trap? As an institution, Asia Society Hong Kong Center seeks to build connections between Asia and the world, between the past and the future. Our programs often highlight the accomplishments of the business, government, artistic, civil society leaders of the region. In doing so, we aim to inspire young people. This year, thanks to the support of Mr. Robert Ng at the Ng Teng Fung Charitable Foundation, Asia Society Hong Kong Center proudly presents the Movers and Shaker Fireside Chat Program. It's a 12 to 18 month program aimed at helping Hong Kong students develop global competence and leadership skills. Aimed at inspiring and instilling inventiveness and entrepreneurship among students, it provides exposure and experience for students to help them on their journey of self-discovery to create meaningful career paths. Our arts and cultural program have also underscored our commitment to presenting relevant and engaging events that reflects Asia today. In January, we had four sold out performances of Mila, an original chamber opera commissioned by Asia Society Hong Kong Center, written by an Hong Kong playwright, Candace Chung, that tells the story of a Filipino domestic worker and her Hong Kong family that she worked for. A Mila tour at the end of 2019 to New York and San Francisco is in the works, thanks to the support of Hong Kong Arts Development Council. And I hope that will help kick off Asia Society Hong Kong Center's 30th anniversary celebration, which will be January of 2020. The proceeds from tonight's gala dinner will help us to continue to bring excellent programs featuring global and Asian thought leaders and pioneering arts and culture program featuring dynamic artists from all over the world. I know you've seen some of that video, uh, some of the uh, photos already. And now it's really my great pleasure to recognize tonight's uh, dinner sponsors. Platinum sponsors, KPMG, Morningside and Ronnie Chen, Gold sponsors, Grace Financial Limited, Sterling Private Management Limited, Lazar Hong Kong, uh, Primavera Capital, William Peng, Eric Lee, Shanghai Treasure Carbon New en Energy Environmental Protection Technology Company Limited, New Scientific Renaissance Company Limited, Young's Enterprise Holding Limited, our silver sponsors, Asia Society Japan Center, and I want to uh, welcome our newest center um, who has a, a representative from the Japan Center here tonight. Thank you. The center was only open just two months ago. Bloomberg LP, Esquel Group, uh, Ms. Marjorie Yang, Goldman Sachs, Hong Lung Properties Limited, JP Morgan, Jepson and Company Limited, MWYO, Mr. Oliver Wiesberg, Alice Mong, me, uh, Silverhorn, SPCC, CUHK, Better Hong Kong Foundation, Student Table Sponsor, Esquel Group, uh, again, 
Ms. Marjorie Yang, Morningside, Salon Films, Hong Kong Limited, Mr. Fred Wong, Tung Foundation, and SPCCCUHK, Mr. Chen Lee. And also Ms. Loretta Lee, who is sponsoring a table for Hong Kong U medical students. Thanks also to our co-conspirator for tonight's program, and that's Dr. Ruth Shapiro of CAPS, Center for Asian Philanthropy and Society. Thank you, Ruth. And I also want to acknowledge the hard work and dedication of my staff, uh, especially Penny Tang. Tonight's dinner was put together in one month. Uh, I know it's, we, we, we pull miracle to put together tonight's program uh, and with a record attendance of over almost 440 and 20% of those who are attending tonight are students. And I know they're in the back. You know, I wanna ask the students to stand up and recognize. Students. My deepest gratitude for everyone's support. You can sit down now. Thank you, students. Um, next year, we have already have the date marked. So it'll be November 21st, 2019. We're planning ahead because I have a feeling next year we're going to fill this ballroom, which has a capacity of 800. Um, and next year, November 21st, just so you know, it's one week before Thanksgiving. So put it on your calendar now. Um, because I really do want to fill this ballroom next year. And I would like to end by giving you an assignment. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the 40th anniversary of the uh, opening of China. Um, I hope at your tables there is um, a sheet of paper uh, or some sort of, uh, I think it is there, I hope. Uh, because one of the things we want to find out and also kind of get your information, where you were 40 years ago in 1979. You don't have to tell us the specifics, and it doesn't have to be long. Um, just tell us where you were in 1979 when China was about to open up. I can tell you I was a high school student in Ohio uh, getting ready to vote for my first presidential election. The reason we want you to share your 1979 memory with us is that we want your contact information, and we will be doing a drawing. And the winner will get a one-year President's Circle membership which is valued at about $25,000. And you, if you are already a PC member, we will extend your PC membership by one year. And students, I know some of you were not even born yet in 1979. I would still encourage you to take part in this uh, writing exercise. Uh, write down where you think your parents were in 1979, uh, because we wanted you to get in on the action. Um, but it's a way of kind of for us to start planning our celebration for our 30th anniversary. Um, anniversaries allow us to look back and also look forward. So with that, I would like now to invite Asian Society Hong Kong Chairman Ronnie Chen to make some opening remark. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. I'm standing between you and dinner, so I'll be short. All I want to do is to recognize a few very, very special individuals. We're very, very honored that the Chief Executive of Hong Kong, Mrs. Kara Lam, can be with us. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chief Executive of Hong Kong. We're also very happy that the Secretary for Constitutional and Mainland Affairs, Mr. Patrick Nip, is also with us. Patrick. <laughs> then we have two uh, global trustees. I'm no, by the way, I'm no longer the global trustee, let alone the chairman, okay? Uh, but we do have two global trustees here with us, and we're delighted that they can, be, uh, they can join. And one comes from uh, Los Angeles. Many of you know he's known as the homeless billionaire or something like that. Uh, Nicholas Bergruen, he's an old friend of mine of 30 years. Well, we're still both young, but anyway, uh, we're delighted, Nicholas, that you can be here. And also we have Nicholas Akusin, the, uh, the chairman of uh, uh, JP Morgan in this part of the world. Both of them are members of the global board. So may I ask Nicholas and, uh, and then uh, Kucho to rise.
Then I also want to follow、uh, Alice. She she mentioned that、uh, we have the newest center in Japan. That is a center that have been work. I've been working on it for fifteen years, perhaps, and I always fail. But thank God, maybe that's why they kicked me out of the board. But anyway, we're delighted that、uh, some a few of them are joining us here today. So Terry, James Kondo, where are you? Can you? Yeah. Okay. Very good. And the, all the friends from、uh, Japan, please. Okay, the rest I will not recognize、uh, one by one, so you don't need to stand. But anyway, I'm delighted that、uh, a former colleague of、uh, Dr. Jim Kim is with us, and she is the dean of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, Dean Michelle Williams.、Uh, we're delighted to have you. We also have、uh, Mr. Tsai Jinyong. He is the first Chinese to ever become the head. Of an international organization, in this case, IFC,、uh, Mr. Tsai. <laughs> Then,、uh, just another guest, but this guest is very un unusual, so I have to mention his name, and、uh, not just because he's my friend, but because he's, and not just because he's a co-founder of Tencent. Joe, we do have someone from Tencent here. Uh, uh, <laughs> Two of China's、uh, most amazing company, and he is one of five founders of Tencent. And he retired a few years ago and decided to devote his time to giving his money away. And so he has been very busy, busier than ever before. And、uh, I'm delighted that you have not only founded a college, the Wuhan College in、uh, Wuhan, but also he has、uh, started the thing called the Idan Prize for Education.、Uh, and it's really a great thing that you have done. So. Charles, rise to be recognized. And surprise, surprise! This year's one of the two winners of the Yudan Prize for Educational Development is with us. Many of you have heard of edX professor from MIT, Anand Agarwal. Anand, great to have you. Anyway, that's all I will say, and、uh, I just want to give you one house rule. Okay, this is the practice of Asia Society, and also because I promised to、uh, Carrie Lam a few years ago that we will continue to bring many of our students here. And our house rule is that if during Q and A time a student raises his hand or her hand, and somebody else. Who pays a lot of money to be here? But thank you very much. And the student paid nothing.、Uh, the students get the first crack. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to have so many bright young people in Hong Kong. Bon appetit. I will come back to introduce our two speakers later. Have a good time. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? I hope you are enjoying your dinner. We're delighted that the owner of this hotel is here, and she is a member of the Asia Society. Just a little quiz: Who do you think is the oldest person in this room? How old? What would you say? How old? The oldest person in this room. You know, after all, we're the Asia Society, and in Asia, we do respect the elderly, right? Okay. The oldest person in this room is 98 year old. She happened to be my mother. Anyway, welcome again, ladies and gentlemen. The Asia Society has been in Hong Kong now for 30 years. We have gone on from strength to strength, and thanks to our now chief executive, Mrs. Carrie Lam, we worked together very closely in order to build the headquarter building of the Asia Society here. For those of you who have not visited us, 
You haven't been to the best place in Hong Kong yet. I encourage you to go take a look. But we're delighted that so many of you from Hong Kong, from the mainland of China, from the rest of Asia, and indeed from the rest of the world are joining us here today. Another quiz. When did we last have a president of the World Bank in our midst? Anybody know? 1997. That was a year that Hong Kong returned to China and the World Bank, which always have strong leadership, at least most of the time. At that time, they have a very good leader, happened to be a friend of mine, Jim Wolfenson. He brought the World Bank to have their meeting in Hong Kong in September of 1997. How happy we are that after all these years, we're able to have another president of the World Bank, Dr. Jim Kim, here with us. I think there are some people that are smart. A lot of, I think everybody in this room is probably very smart. Otherwise, you're probably are not here. And the smartest maybe the students back there, I don't know. <laughs> but there are just some people who are super, super smart. And, you know, having given a little bit of philanthropy, d done that to some universities, you get to meet a lot of very, very smart people. But not every one of them is very nice. But tonight we have someone who is very, very, very smart and very, very, very nice. In particular, I'm just delighted that Dr. Kim received his last two... Well, actually, he wasn't born in America. He was born in Korea in 1959. And then when he was, you were five-year-old, you moved to this country. And the rest is history. He moved to... Iowa, isn't it the town where President Xi Jinping lived when he was a young man? I think there was Muscatine, that was the town, right? So Dr. Jim, wow, that's, that town is important. It has two great men that came out of it. Anyway, Dr. Kim went on eventually to uh, receive his MD degree and then his PhD degree, both from Harvard. And I'm happy to say that Dr. Kim was once upon a time a faculty member of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And of course, his career, we all know, has gone on from strength to strength. But it, is, it seems quite clear to people that from day one, he really has a heart for humanity. And then he started a thing called PIH. I think many of you have heard of it, Partners in Health. And they, I just asked him, I said, Dr. Kim, you know, they, 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 they try to deal with the HIV problem, the tuberculosis problem. They're now dealing with the cancer problem. I said, it takes a lot of money. Where do you get those money? Well, Dr. Kim told me they raise every bit of it. So he brought, built that organization. He was the director of it for many years. And then he went, to, he went on to WHO. And then eventually he became the, was it the 17th president of Dartmouth College? Dr. Kim, I don't know if you have, there's anything that you haven't done for mankind. But anyway, it's wonderful that you have done so much for mankind in so many areas. But perhaps, we don't know, maybe the greatest accomplishment he has done so far is maybe at the World Bank. I don't know if you ever will leave the World Bank, Dr. Kim, and what else can you do for humanity? We are all waiting and looking forward to it. So the program today is very simple. I'm going to invite Dr. Kim here. He's going to make some remarks for about 20 minutes, and then I will invite the other guest, which is wonderful, and th that is uh, Joe Chai. Many of you know Joe. And Joe, you know, we have a public, uh, shall I say, public sector leader, and then a private sector leader, and have them have a dialogue and interact with each other. I think that should be a very, very uh, thoughtful time and very, very meaningful time. So, ladies and gentlemen, with that, can I welcome to the stage Dr. Jim Kim the president of the World Bank. Well, thank you very much. First of all, let me say thanks to Ronnie Chan. You know, uh, when we heard, and, and uh, Dean Williams is here today, when we heard that, that the Chan family had $300 million uh, to the School of Public Health, uh, all of us who've been working in this field, by the way, uh, uh, a, a, and, and Michelle, close your ears for a second, Dean of the School of Public Health. An MPH degree, a master's in public health, is one of the few degrees 
that you can get that's guaranteed to lower your income prospects. Uh, but for the good. I mean, these are people who do such great work, and so they're not a lot of uh, ultra high net worth individuals uh, uh, that will support something like a School of Public Health, but the work of the School of Public Health is so important. So Ronnie, I wanna, in front of all your peers, thank you for, for, for doing it. It, it was an absolutely visionary gift, and all of us who have been in this field are grateful. Now, you know, at, at this um, event with the Asia Society, I thought I'd give you a little bit of my background, and, and Ronnie told you, but um, uh, I was born, let's see, I was born in Korea in 1959. That's me, right? <laughs> uh, now, the story is that both my parents were refugees in the war. So both of them, my father escaped from North Korea by himself, has, has, he, he died many years ago, but didn't see any of his brothers and sisters after he escaped. My mother was a war refugee, lost her mother during the war, and literally carried her young, youngest daughter on her back as she escaped Seoul to, to go to the south in Pusan. So uh, they, they actually got scholarships, fortunate to get scholarships to come to the United States to study, and they actually met in the United States. There were only about three or 400 Koreans in all of mainland United States at that time, and they got together every um, holiday, and they met, married. My older brother was born in New York City, but then they went back to Korea like they were supposed to do. Uh, I was born in Korea, my sister, younger sister was born in Korea, and this is about 1962, right? And so in 1962, Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world. This is what the World Bank Group had to say about Korea that um, uh, the World Bank said that the Koreans were so poor and so bereft of promise that they would not qualify for a World Bank loan. And so in 1962, they said Korea would find it difficult without foreign aid to provide its people with more than the bare necessities of life. So the first World Bank loan in Korea was in 1963. It was for a road. The second World Bank loan happened a few years after that and it was for education. And the World Bank um, group uh, uh, staff at the time ridiculed Korea for doing something so stupid as to invest in education. Right? The, the, of course, we all know the rest of the story. And uh, my own staff members uh, gave me this report and wrote on the, on, the, on the cover of it, isn't it funny how wrong we get it sometimes at the World Bank group? Right? Now, so, so 1962, and, it, and at this time, those of you who know Korea, 62, 63, 64 was a time of tremendous upheaval. There were demonstrations in the streets all the time. And so my parents in 1964 decided that they wanted to give us better opportunities and take us to the United States. So we went to the United States, and my father had to repeat. He was a fully trained dentist, but he had to repeat dental school in the United States because they didn't they didn't honor a, a, a Korean dental degree. Uh, my mother ended up getting a PhD in, uh, in uh, philosophy and religion. And interestingly, she studied Chu Xi. Many of you will know Chu Xi was one of the most famous Neo-Confucian scholars. And when the Chinese government found out that my mother was a Chu Xi scholar, they took me to every single site that Chu Xi had ever been, right? And, and it, it, it was very exciting for me to see it, but um, uh, this, this connection with China is quite profound. Now, Ronnie mentioned, uh, when I met President Xi for the first time six years ago, uh, Jin Yong was, was, was with me, uh, we walked in the room, he had just started, I had just started, and I walked in the room and I'd read about him and I said, President Xi, you know, um, it's a great honor to meet you, we have something in common. And he said, yes, I know, you're from Muscatine, Iowa. How are my friends the Landys, right? So the Landys were the lawyer family in town, my father was one of the dentists in town, and we were very close to the Landys. So uh, to this day, when I see him, we joke about Iowa. I, ca I call him my Iowa homeboy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, to this day, uh, we have these conversations. And his, his view of the United States was deeply impacted by his experience of spending almost a month uh, in, uh, in my hometown. I, we had left by then. Now, this is me growing up in Iowa. 
And when I, you know, sometimes people say, well, he was a quarterback on his football team. I'm telling you, don't be impressed. We had the longest losing streak in the nation uh, when, I, when I took this photo. But the point is, you know, we, we moved to, to the United States when I was five years old, and we grew up in the middle of nowhere. I forgot how to speak Korean. Uh, my brother and I spoke until we were, I was five and he was six and a half. My brother still doesn't speak Korean. I went back and learned it. But we grew up in the Midwest in, in typical fashion. And I didn't know what the World Bank was. Um, uh, when I was graduating from high school, I had, I had done well in high school. I was valedictorian. I had done pretty well on my SAT scores. And I went to the Muscatine High School guidance counselor and said, what do you think I should go to school? And she said, hey, Jim, you've done really, really well. So not only should you apply to the University of Iowa, you should also consider applying to University of Wisconsin, right? <laughs> <clears throat> and and then, then one summer, I, I went to a summer science program at the University of Iowa, and I met all these kids from Long Island, a lot of them Jewish kids from Long Island, and they basically said, are you kidding? You know, you've got to come to the East Coast. So I ended up going to Brown University. Now, this is the last part of this introductory piece. And so at Brown University, I was just completely turned on. I couldn't believe how smart these kids were, how worldly uh, they were. And so I, I came home uh, after uh, uh, one of the semesters, and my father picked me up at the airport. It was in Iowa, just a little way up the road. And I got in the car, he was driving, and um, he said, so Jim, what are you gonna study? And I said, you know, Dad, I'm so excited by what I've learned at Brown. I'm gonna study philosophy and political science, and I think I'm gonna become a politician. So he slowly pulled the car over to the side of the road. <laughs> and he said, he said, Jim, after you finish your medical residency, you can study anything you want. Right? <laughs> now, I wasn't sure if people here would laugh. Because when I tell the story to a group of Korean, Korean uh, parents, nobody laughs. They just, <laughs> of course, you know, uh, of course that's what you do. Right? So, so I essentially did what my father told me to do. I got into an MD-PhD program uh, at, at, uh, at Harvard. I did my PhD, though, in anthropology, which is kind of like philosophy and political science. And I studied the, the problem of health in developing countries. And so this is the town of Caraballo, a very poor community in the northern cone of Lima. And it was there uh, organization, Partners in Health, discovered an outbreak of multidrug-resistant tuberculosis. We went from house to house, we saw the patients, and we uh, found that, uh, that the world had said, no, leave them alone, don't treat them, they're so poor. But we were going crazy because we were saying, wait a minute, tuberculosis, infectious disease, it keeps, it keeps infecting others until you treat the ones who have it. And so we were able to change global policy around how you respond to drug-resistant TB. And then, of course, there was a and this is uh, Joseph Jun, uh, one of our patients in Haiti. He came looking like this. And this is what HIV used to be like before we had antiretroviral medications. But in, in, uh, this, this was um, around 2001 that Joseph came to our, our, uh, our clinic. And in 2001, despite the fact that we'd had antiretrovirals since 1996, the entire world had said, forget it. You're not going to be able to treat HIV in developing countries. And so basically, the entire world uh, was saying uh, all 25 million people in developing countries with HIV, I'm sorry, you're all just going to have to die. Because they were saying it's too expensive, it's too complicated. So we, we showed the entire world, just like we did with drug-resistant TB, we showed the entire world that, in fact, it's possible to treat HIV. And the so-called Lazarus effect of HIV, and Dean Williams knows this very, very well, the, the, you know, how can you say to 20 million people in Africa, I'm sorry, you're all dead because it's just inconvenient for us to treat you with HIV. But Dean Williams, remember, almost nobody in the public health world said we should treat HIV. So that's what we did at Partners in Health. That's what we were doing. That's what I was doing, minding my own business, until I got a call from uh, Tim Geithner. So Timothy Geithner, Dartmouth class of 83, a friend of mine through Dartmouth, he called me out of the blue when I was at Dartmouth College. And he said, Jim, would you like to um, become, be a candidate for being president of the World Bank? And, and I said, well, Tim, you know, I edited a book that called for the closing of the World Bank a few years ago, right? <laughs> and 
he, he said, yeah, we know, we know. Well, why don't you come down and talk to President Obama? And so I said, when? He said, how about tomorrow, right? So I literally had to get on a plane and fly from Hanover uh, down to Washington, D.C. And when I walked in the room, uh, President Obama, with that voice, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the um, uh, Oval Office, said, so Jim, why should I nominate you, of all people, you, and not, let's say, a macroeconomist to be president of the World Bank? And so I said to President Obama, hey, Obama, have you ever read your mother's PhD dissertation? Looked at me and said, well, yes, I have. In 2004, after he gave the speech at the Democratic National Convention, I was so obsessed with this guy. And I found out that his mother, like me, had gotten her PhD in anthropology. So I was like the fourth person to request a copy of her dissertation <laughs> from the University of Michigan archives, right? And I had read the whole thing, and it hadn't been published. Later it was published, but it hadn't been published. So I said, well, you remember, President Obama, that your mother showed that all the macroeconomists predicted that globalization would wipe out the Indonesian artisanal industry. But she showed that the Indonesian artisanal industry boomed with globalization. So I'm not going to tell you what the world looks like from 30,000 feet like a macroeconomist, but I've been on the ground doing this work my whole life. I'll be able to tell you if the programs are working. He looked at me and he said, I get that. Later, in a social moment, literally drinking martinis, President Obama looked at me and said, you know, Jim, that was one of the best ploys to get a job I've ever seen. <laughs> so for the young people in the audience, read the president's mother's thesis. <laughs> so uh, what's happening in the world, right? Uh, in, in, uh, in, in 1990, 35% of the world lived in extreme poverty. 35, a third of the world, right? But in 2011, only less than 10% of the people live in extreme poverty. And why is that? China. China lifted 800 million people out of extreme poverty. And with all the critiques that are happening in all parts of the world of China, I keep reminding people this is historic. It's never been done, not even close. Not even close. I was just talking with Joe. I visited Guizhou, and the Chinese said, you keep going to the rich areas, Jim. We're going to take you to the poor area. Guizhou, third poorest province in China, it went from 30% poverty to 8% poverty in five years, over the last five years. And in, in my view, it was because a Taobao village was created there. Right? So <laughs> huge, huge implications for what we do in terms of eliminating poverty in the rest of the world. There are enormous problems that present an existential threat. So maybe not for you, uh, but for your, chil your children certainly, and for your grandchildren absolutely certainly, climate change is a fundamental existential threat. There's more carbon in the air now than there was uh, last 650,000 years. You know, one of the most striking examples to me is that people died in, in Japan Japan is the best prepared uh, country in the world to manage disasters. In fact, the, the, along with the Japanese, we have done tremendous amount of work helping other countries prepare for disasters, but people died in Japan. The severity of the flooding, uh, the, the, the extent and the rapidity with which uh, the polar ice caps are melting, this is an existential threat. The good news is that the solution is not more meetings and more agreements. The solution is the existing capital sitting on the sidelines work in pushing toward climate smart in infrastructure. We'll talk more about that in a bit. I see this everywhere in the world, right? So by 2025 or so, every person on Earth is going to have access to broadband. Now, every person on Earth might not have a smartphone, but probably every person on the Earth will have access to a smartphone. And we actually know exactly what happens when people get access to the internet or when they have a smartphone and they can see how other people live. One, at first, when you get access to the internet, your satisfaction with life goes up. You're happier about the, the situation that you're in. But then the other thing that happens is that your reference income goes up. The income to which you compare your own goes up. 
And so we've done studies, and you know, it, for, for middle class people, if the reference income for the country goes up 10%, your income has to go up 5% for you to have the same level of satisfaction. But if you're poor, if the reference income goes up 10%, your income has to go up 20% to have the same satisfaction. Aspirations everywhere in the world are exploding. Everyone, soon enough, is going to have more or less middle class aspirations. Now, you have to understand how different that is over the last 15 years than it's been for the previous 5,000 years. Right? 200 years ago, literally everyone was poor, except a few royal families and the bourgeoisie that grew up around them. Everybody was poor. Everyone was tied to their land. Everyone was essentially living a subsistence lifestyle. Right? Uh, the bourgeoisie grew, the middle class grew, and never, though, on Earth have we been in a situation where just about everybody has middle class aspirations, but very few of the means to actually achieve that middle class lifestyle. This is happening everywhere. Now, the reason I show you this picture is because the traditional answer to poverty was, well, every country will go through what Korea went through, what Japan went through, what China's now going through. They'll go from agriculture to light manufacturing, and then eventually to heavy industry. But guess what? The light manufacturing, this is a, a, a factory in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has the most efficient garment industry in the world. But in Bangladesh, they're buying something called Sobots, S-E-W-B-O-T-S. -E a Sobot from a, the built in Atlanta can sew a t-shirt in 22 seconds, half the time that the best people in Bangladesh can sew. There's not a single factory that I visited in Africa that does better than 60% of Bangladeshi uh, uh, efficiency. The only reason they're still ex in existence is because of things like the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which gives preferential access to markets for Africans making garments. The garment industry is not going to come to the poorest countries. And so if the garment industry is not going to come, what is the likelihood that heavy industry will come? Almost zero. So you have rapidly rising aspirations and a fundamental rupture in what we've always thought path for poor countries. Now, three ways that we're trying to solve this problem of inequality and poverty in the world. The first is to build foundations. We've always been focused on economic growth, but now we know that economic growth has to be more inclusive and has to be sustainable. It, you know, the global market capitalist system has to work for everyone and the planet. That's now our motto at the World Bank. We've got to make the system work for everyone. President Xi, two days before the inauguration of uh, President Trump, gave a speech at Davos in which he said, the global system is the ocean we all swim in. Any effort to turn this ocean back into lakes and streams and stop the flow of trade, people, capital, ideas, goods, will fail. Right? We believe that. We believe that the argument uh, between uh, people focused on markets and people focused on planned economies that just trade with each other, that argument's basically over. As President Xi has told us, we've got to build these societies. The second is resiliency to climate change, to family dependence, and we focus on that. And finally, investing in people. Let me take you through all of them in just a So, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, Jin Yong was uh, at IFC when we completely turned around the building of the Queen Ali International Airport. So uh, uh, King Abdullah, one of, the, one of the great leaders in the world, King Abdullah wanted to take a loan to pay for the airport. Not for the whole airport, but for, most of the, for a good chunk of the airport. We came in and said, you don't need to use your own resources. You don't need to take a loan. We can do this completely in the private sector. And so IFC built this $900 million. And instead of paying back a loan, and facing huge losses because their government was going to try to run this airport, now being run by a private company. And over the past eight years, instead of paying to keep up the airport, they've received in dollars in fees and taxes from the running of this airport. This is the kind of infrastructure we have to build. And many of you in this room could participate in something like this. Uh, Internet. We have to build the broadband. I told you that there's a they're going to downside of broadband, but we've got no choice. I've been telling uh, uh, Joe Tsai all uh, evening long that I think the Alibaba model and also the Tencent model. I don't want to be um, uh, partisan here. 
But those e-platform models could be the answer, but it won't be the answer until we build broadband, roads, and some form of electricity, not necessarily grids, but maybe, maybe uh, you know, uh, 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 renewable energy that's in the form of micro or mini grids. In societies. There is huge potential in, in solar energy, and we need now to focus on both uh, adaptation and mitigation of climate change. Andrew Steer is here. here. He, he, he knows more about this than I do. But there are so many business opportunities uh, where you can reduce the footprint and also make money that those markets uh, work. Uh, for example, uh, things like Ebola. Uh, at the World Bank, what we are now doing is we created an insurance instrument for pandemics. Uh, the last Ebola outbreak was terrible. 11,000 people dead. It was awful. And it was awful is because no money flowed. In fact, the first money that flowed came from the World Bank. We never do that. I happen to be an infectious disease doctor, and I, I made the money flow. But we now have an insurance instrument that automatically releases when uh, 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 outbreaks of Ebola, of SARS, of flu reach a certain level. We know we can do this, and we know we can build resilience in societies through market mechanisms. Uh, but finally, and, and, and this is my last topic, it's investing in people. So uh, we call it human capital. And it, it, human capital is, is, is really the, the uh, status of education uh, in any given country. We are living in the middle of an absolute human capital crisis. Let me explain. You know, when I was, uh, when I was a professor at the, at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, I spent a lot of my time arguing loudly, more money, more money, donors have to give more money for health and education. And when I started at the Chan School of, uh, of Public Health, there were a couple hundred million dollars being given you know, uh, per year, less than the amount of the Chan family donation to the School of Public Health, about 200 million was available for all of global health back in the, the mid to late 1990s, just tiny amounts of money. And so we argued, and now there's 20, 30 billion dollars available for health and education. But it's nowhere near enough. And so people like me, who've been arguing so vociferously for more donations, we're now looking at a situation where the heads of state and the ministers of finance in developing countries are hiding behind philanthropists. They are not investing their own money, and they're basically saying, if you give us money for health and education, we'll spend it, but if not, we won't, because you know, we've got to build hard infrastructure first. We've got to build roads first. And so we asked a fundamental question. What is the most, uh, what is the correlation between and economic issue? Uh, childhood stunting. Uh, is uh, children two, set, two standard deviations below height for age. Uh, by the time that these children are five, their deficits are locked, literally locked into their brains. They have as much as 40% less brain volume, many millions of fewer neuronal connections. We know that these young people uh, never learn as well and never earn as much. So literally, these people are locked into being unable, probably, to compete in the digital economy of the future. Guess how many, what percentage of children in the world are stunted? 25%. India, 38% childhood stunting. When I met Prime Minister Modi for the first time, I told him, this is a crisis. It's like a medical emergency. You have to jump on this now. Right? Um, most of Africa average 30%. So what do you do when there are situations like this and our success has allowed heads of state and finance ministers to sit back and say, well, of course we're committed to health and education, just give us the money. So I had to wake them up. I had to hold their feet to the fire. What we did was we had educational outcomes. And All right. There, there, there's so much testing now that we actually came up with a scale called learning adjusted years of schooling. Before, all we had was just years of schooling. But we didn't really know what a year of schooling was worth in one country versus another. And so, unfortunately, we found out that a year of school in Cote d'Ivoire uh, 
is worth only 25% of a year of school in Singapore. It's not working. Okay. So, so uh, we built a scale called Learning Adjusted Years of Schooling. And that itself seemed, was very highly correlated to economic growth. If we had childhood stunting, under, under five uh, child mortality, adult mortality, two learning adjusted years of schooling, we found that those four indicators were more closely correlated with economic growth looking backward 25 years than anything we had ever seen. So we, we, uh, we did something we did something that I think you can do once in your career as president of the World Bank. We created a ranking system. We ranked countries from 1 to 157 uh, based on those four indicators. And some countries were very unhappy with where they came out in the ranking. But every single newspaper in every single country covered this. Because it turns out uh, that, that um, countries hate it when you compare them to their neighboring country. So countries that have always felt superior to their neighboring country, when they came out ranking below them, there was a crisis. And we created for the first time civil society and, and political pressure on people to invest more in health and education. This is a crisis. Many of you are involved in these issues. Just understand that if you have everyone's aspirations rising, but 30, 35, 40% of your people cannot participate in the kind of economic activity that will give them that kind of potent, that life, that is the source of the instability, the fragility, the conflict, the violence in your society going forward. Now, this is me when I was four, right? And this is me in Tanzania uh, when I was visiting a school. And I, 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 as I always do, I ask these young people, so tell me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, uh, a couple of these children raised their hand, and two of them said, I want to be president of the World Bank. <laughs> and so, uh, like you, the teachers and my own staff laughed. <clears throat> but what I said was, look, you go back one slide. Um, when I was a four-year-old, in class in Korea in 1963, if George David Woods, who's the president of the World Bank uh, in 1963, if he had visited Korea, and it's perfectly plausible that he could have visited Korea, if he'd visited Korea and come to my classroom, I doubt that he would have thought that one of his successors was sitting in that classroom. So I told those kids, don't let anyone tell you that you can't be president of the World Bank. But it's not going to be true unless we do those things that we know we need to do. Inclusive, sustainable economic growth. Uh, use capital markets, every tool you have to foster resilience to the various plagues that we're facing, climate change, uh, um, uh, uh, famine, pandemics. And then finally, and most importantly, invest in people. Thank you very much. <laughs>
what I wanted to say is, um, I, when, when Ronnie, you invited me to do this and you said, we're gonna have Dr. Kim join the stage. I, I was very excited because I know uh, Dr. Kim, you're a great friend with Jack Ma. Um, I always see you together with him, so I'm always like, I'm not worthy. And, um, uh, uh, but I thought to myself, well, here's the bank president. So what's the bank president gonna say? This is this guy with a big balance sheet uh, that's going to go around the world and say, you know, I'll lend to this project, but I'll lend to that project. Do I have anything in common with the bank president? But actually, I think that what you're doing, you're, you're the most incredible social capitalist there is, okay? And, uh, you know, we talk about uh, social investing or social capitalism. And this is, this is a living example of, of social capitalism. And uh, uh, there's no better person to do this and someone with a medical degree and had been a, a, a head, a, a, a president of a major uh, educational institution. I think the two components of making all of this work is for all of us to focus on number one, health, and number two, education. Uh, to, those are really the foundations, and, and this is what Dr. Kim talked about today, so I'm, I really wanted to um, say that uh, I'm incredibly impressed. Well, Joe, you mentioned about health and education. That's very good. I was about to ask you the question about where do we begin? So you believe that the place to begin is health and education. You agree, Dr. Dr. Kim? Well, I, I mean, you know, I told you the numbers. I, yeah, um, okay, sorry. Uh, I, I told you the numbers. And, you know, in, um, uh, you know, you look at India, so, 38% child poverty. Uh, what's it going to mean that 40% of the adults of the next 15 to 20 years are, are going to be in a position where they may not be? Sorry, there's a new hotel, so that they have probably have not tested. Maybe, maybe Joe and I yeah, Joe. Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, I, I think I think that um, there's no question that that we have to get on emergency footing with health and education. Uh, we, have to, we have to just get going as soon as possible. But it doesn't mean that you stop on the other things. We also have to, to tackle climate change. We also have to build infrastructure. And I, let, let me say that you know, uh, uh, I, I've been spending so much time in, in, with Alibaba, with Jack and others, because I think, I think potentially they're uh, providing the answer to how to go forward. You know, um, it's not... Uh, you know, I, um, uh, Jin Yong uh, Tsai, he taught me that I shouldn't talk about social capitalism. Uh, because the thing is, uh, these problems are not going to be solved until it becomes commercially viable, right? And we think that there are ways, uh, health and education is hard, right? that we're not going to be able to make that commercially viable anytime soon. They're just going to, we're going to have to actually create space uh, uh, for governments to invest in health and education. And create, and create pressure. We're doing that. Uh, but uh, we have to figure out ways to give a good return to the owners of capital while at the same time transforming outcomes. And I, I tell I, you, know, to me, Alibaba, Tencent, the companies in China have democratized access to capital, democratized access to markets in a way that is extremely encouraging, and they've made money at the same time. I think that combination is, uh, is, is something that we have to constantly look for. I think it's just that the microphones don't like me. I, no, I think no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, mine, mine is working. Uh, <laughs> you know, these, these two guys are always one step ahead of me. What I want to ask is this. Jim, that takes a lot of money. This what? It takes a lot of money. And to, to make it such that it can become self-sustaining. I don't know if you have figured out a model yet. So, so how do we, what, number one, where does your initial capital come from? And number two, how do you make it profitable, sustainable? So, so let me, you, you know, if you just look at, for example, ask, ask yourself a question, how much money is sitting in negative interest rate bonds? And those in the financial industry know that negative interest rate bond is like the Japanese Central Bank or the European Central Bank 
you give them your money, and not only do they not pay you interest, you pay them every year for the pleasure of holding your money. So there's six trillion dollars in negative interest rate bonds. There's 15 to 20 trillion in very low yielding government bonds. And there's eight trillion or so, uh, at, you know, this, we do this every few weeks, eight trillion in cash, literally 1,000 euro bills sitting in people's safes. So that's close to 30, 30, 30 to 35 trillion dollars. So if we have a new kind of capitalist out there creating these opportunities, uh, there's so much money sitting on the sidelines, and there's so many people out there talking about impact investing. Unfortunately, there are very few people who are actually doing impact investing, but um, at last count, there was some $45 trillion being managed by either asset owners or asset allocators who have uh, professed an interest in ESG, environment, social governance, uh, uh, in, in investing, and in impact investing. But the problem is that there are not enough capitalists uh, who are out there trying to look for these deals. So that's really what we need. And this is why I think Alibaba, and again, I, you know, I usually say Alibaba, but here I have to say Tencent as well, right? right? Uh, because you guys have done great. You know, uh, they have found a model that, in my view, actually does that. It actually creates, you know, to, 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 I was a, 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 an enthusiast of Alibaba and, and Tencent before. When I saw Guizhou, right, I saw an impact in an entire province, I think 35, 40 million people, dropping the poverty rate and, it, and, and teaching them the skills they needed to compete in, uh, uh, in, in the global digital economy. I was blown away because I had seen it be successful, but I hadn't seen it take... A, a, a province that's larger than most African countries uh, uh, and brought the poverty rate down so quickly. Yeah. Incorrect, really? Alibaba has figured that one out? How do you do it? Uh, I think the power in the internet is really um, something to marvel at. And what the internet does is to lower the cost of obtaining information. And uh, I think there's so much inefficiency. You're talking about $6 trillion worth of bonds and neg negative interest rates. Uh, but there are plenty of opportunities for the, uh, for the money to flow into that. But the matching of that money to the opportunity is the big problem. And the internet is the one that lowers the cost of matching. And also, I think in the industrial stage, in the industrial you know, world, uh, uh, the entire world is moving towards consolidation and standardization. So, you know, your iPhone model is just one model. Uh, but with the internet, it makes the long tail demand, satisfying the long tail demand possible. Uh, and if you really understand consumers, I don't want to just buy one iPhone. I want to buy different kinds of iPhone, uh, maybe with different memory, different camera uh, uh, capability and things like that. But the problem is, how are you going to unearth those de that kind of demand? Uh, Apple is not able to predict how much inventory they take on with each different kinds of model, so they just make one. Uh, but I think with the internet, to, to, uh, uh, the, the cost of information coming down, uh, the, long, the long tail demand can better be satisfied. And I think that's how we do it. With uh, uh, what Dr. Kim referred to, uh, the Alibaba villages, uh, or the Taobao villages that we're doing in the rural areas, what we're doing is to unlock the productive capability of the people, whether they're making furniture or making farming products, and supplying those products to people who are living in the cities. And without the internet, that would never be possible. You would never be able to discover that people living in Shanghai would like to have uh, 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 some kind of a strange uh, uh, you know, kiwi fruit or buy furniture that's made in Guizhou, you know, you would never be able to discover that. But I think now when information becomes more transparent through the internet, that, that's all possible. So are you just trying to make it more efficient? Is that what it is? Well, okay, let me just, so um, uh, I was blown away when Jack told me, I think it was maybe a year and a half ago, he said that um, on, if, you're, if, you're a, if you're a member of the Alibaba system, and you have shown that uh, through all of your online behavior uh, that you can handle that money. You can get as much as one million renminbi, right? That was, you, it may be higher now. 
in two seconds, right? It takes one second to do their uh, um, electronic uh, KYC and one second to transfer the money into your account. Now that's just so different from every country, just about every country I work in. If you're a woman, it's harder to get credit. If you don't have collateral, it's harder to get credit. The KYC is so cumbersome. And the, the KYC now takes one second. And it's based on data. And, 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 and their uh, rate of non-performing loans is smaller than uh, just about any bank in, in the world. And so it's not just the internet. It's how you use it. It's how you use that uh, internet. And so they, I, I, you know, I don't know how they do it. I'm not a computer scientist, but they're just grinding all the time and finding new ways to do this. And so, I, you know, I'm thinking if we can bring some of that speed and and access to the, the poorest countries, and then we invest enough in health and education, then everybody at least has a chance. And that's that's what we're trying for. We're not, you know, I think we've learned that if you try to equalize outcomes. Everyone's the same. Everyone gets the same. I mean, all you need to do to find out if that works or not is to ask China and Vietnam. And they'll tell you, you know, that didn't work so well for us. So, so then if it doesn't work, what do you have to sort of morally and ethically believe in? You have to morally and ethically believe in equality of opportunity. But that's not just access to education. It's access to good education. And it's access to capital, access to markets, all those things. And, you know, I don't know, how, you know, I've been asking Joe about the culture. I don't know how they did it, uh, but this focus on, on, on small and medium enterprises, and even you know, micro enterprises, that focus has led to a business model that, that again, um, you know, we have to see if we can make this work uh, in Africa and other places. Joe, do you do it for profit or as a non-profit? Um, have to do we, it for profit. It won't we, be sustainable if they don't do it for profit. We, we yeah. do it for profit because our shareholders wouldn't uh, continue to support us if we didn't do it for profit and give them a fair return on their capital. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about sort of how we do it at two different levels. One is uh, with culture, as uh, uh, Jim pointed out. At Alibaba, uh, we have a mission. Our mission is to make it easy to do business anywhere. And very much embedded in that mission is to support small businesses. Right. And uh, uh, so we firmly believe at Alibaba that uh, social responsibility it has to be baked into your business model. It, it's, we don't have a separate ESG department. Uh, our, and our ESG department is our entire company. The CEO is our head of ESG because that is that we bake environmental concerns, social responsibility, good governance into our business model to, to, to make it work. And uh, uh, so with, with our focus on small businesses, uh, we're our focus on younger people, innovation, and also women entrepreneurs. These are the sort of the major focus areas where all of our business units are, are geared towards. So at the culture level, that's from top to bottom, that's our culture. Uh, and now the how at the sort of practical level. Uh, Jim talked about data, uh, and I think right now, Data is kind of a dirty word because people con are concerned about privacy. But this concern about data privacy is such a elite first world problem that maybe the top 1% of the people with outsized voice are worried about uh, that they ignore the benefits of having data uh, uh, for the rest of the world. Uh, the other half of the world that are making below $5.50 day, uh, if you ask them, would you be willing to uh, uh, allow someone to capture your data so that they could track your behavior so that when the time comes when you need to have a loan, they can assess whether you can be granted uh, a $5 loan or $500 loan, right? Uh, I, think, I, I think, you know, uh, you probably won't, you know, very few people would get zero, but a lot of them will have high, higher credit uh, uh, ratings with uh, higher you know, credit capacity or lower credit capacity. That's the whole point. And uh, so what we do is we, through our internet services, from e-commerce to payment to logistics uh, to entertainment uh, to browsing behavior, uh, everything through a mobile device, uh, we're capturing data about people. That gives us uh, the ability to understand uh, both their consumer demand, but also 
uh, when they're uh, ready to take on loans, uh, we can assess the credit. It sounds to me that you are doing microfinance, except that through the internet. Is that something that, it seems to me, I'm not a technologist either, that no one can monopolize that, right? Anybody can use your platform and do similarly? Well, th those that c have the capability to uh, capture the data, manage the data, and analyze the data are the players that are going to win. And I think going forward, uh, you're going to see uh, naturally the large-scale internet companies having a distinct advantage in, in those areas. So again, the, it may be highly concentrated into a few companies that in the long run may have other issues. But anyway, let's leave it at that. Uh, Dr. Kim, uh, have you seen other models anywhere in the world that similarly can somehow reward the capital provider and yet can really do a lot of good to society? Yeah, you know, th there are, um, so I, you know, um, uh, there are many, many companies that are doing very, very well. So Amazon's doing very well. You know, the, the Apple's doing very well. Uh, you, you know, Uber, with all its problems, uh, created a model that now um, uh, a copycat company called Kareem in, um, um, in, in the Arab world have, has revolutionized the mobility of women because, you know, you're tracking where everybody is on your phone, so it's okay for women in even the most conservative societies to take a Kareem Whereas before they were, you know, they, they couldn't, you know, in some countries they couldn't drive. Therefore, they had to wait for a man in the house to drive them somewhere. So there, you know, these things are multiplying uh, everywhere. And uh, you know, uh, in Kenya, you know, 90 now seven percent of all Kenyans um, uh, uh, use the, the system M-Pesa to transfer money, right? So even people who are illiterate and innumerate, don't even know what numbers are, uh, are now transferring money back and forth with M-Pesa. So there are a lot of different uh, um, uh, innovations in the world. I just ha have to say that, you know, the way that it's developed in China, um, uh, you know, uh, even, even when I first met Jack six and a half years ago, it, it wasn't the extent, there wasn't, it wasn't two seconds six and a half years ago, right? And so um, I, I, ju I just think that, that uh, we're going to have to have some kind of major platform like that. You know, I was very exciting. I, 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 had, a, I had a meeting with uh, Nandan Nilakani. Many of you may know Nandan, one of the founders of Infosys. He created this thing called Adhar. It's the unique identification system in India. Ten fingerprints, two iris prints, and a 12-digit number. And now 1.2 billion people have an identification number, and it's allowed them to give money directly to people in their own bank accounts, and it's uh, gotten rid of more than uh, uh, about 50% of all the money that was being lost when they gave it in cash, right? And so Nandan built that system, and now he's building a system that he says is very much like uh, the Alibaba Tencent platform so that the Indian government can collect outcome numbers on education. Right? So that any, anybody can in, be involved in the platform, you can get all kinds of different data and do all kinds of different analysis, but he's building that now for the education system in India, and uh, we just met last week, and we're going to try to scale it up elsewhere. So uh, you know, what they have done and what others are doing give tremendous opportunity, right? but um, uh, there are just some basic things that we've got to pay attention to uh, be, so, so that everyone can, can have a chance to participate. Well, I'm happy to report that I was with Nandan just uh, uh, about a month ago, less than a month ago in Singapore. I invited him again to come to the A Society to speak. So hopefully pretty soon we'll have a program on, uh, with uh, Nandan uh, Nirkhani of, uh, of Infosys. He's very, very good. His partner, Muti, spoke for us two or, th two or three times before. Anyway, let me turn to another issue, and that is there's a lot of business people here. A lot of them are very, very successful business people. Tomorrow, the Center of Asia Philanthropy and Society will convene in Hong Kong, and we'll have 40, 50 of Asia's biggest uh, uh, successful business people who are also philanthropists uh, joining us. We also have a group of uh, about 10, 15 young, second generation, very successful, very wealthy, mainland Chinese uh, business people here. So what do you suggest that we as businessmen who have one-tenth of a good heart as you do, Jim. Uh, and now that we have made some money, we'd like to give some uh, uh, 
back to society or to do something that is sustainable, uh, can still make some money, but money making may not be the biggest uh, idea for uh, the necessity for us now. What what shall they do? What's your advice to these people? So you know what I what I tell um, our World Bank staff all the time is please don't tell me about how to solve your problem. Tell me about how to solve the problem. Right. In other words. Um, what often happens is that in the world of philanthropy or in the world of multilateral development banks, we compete with each other, and we compete with each other to get our money out the door. If there's a, if there's a really juicy, low-hanging fruit project, um, we all compete to try to give a loan to the government. And if there were an ethical code for multilateral development banks, we would step back because the juicy, low-hanging fruit projects are precisely the ones that are commercially viable, that we could bring in some of this negative interest rate money off the sideline. Right? So um, uh, what I would say is don't give up your business hat when you're, when you're stepping into philanthropy. Now, you know, Bill Gates, uh, he could give, um, he could give uh, you know, uh, $500 million for, um, uh, for uh, polio control. But he knows that if he gives us $50 million, we can give the country uh, $500 million of 0% interest loans. So he leverages his money uh, by using our, our best AAA in the world you know, credit rating. And, and uh, he buys down the interest. And for countries, getting a 30, 40 year maturity loan at 0% interest is, for them, politically, as good as getting a grant because they're, not, they're going to be in power when they have to pay it back. And good news is they actually use it for good things. So, you know, use your business hat. Also, I tell you, I, it, you know, uh, all of official development assistance, all of the aid in the world is about $140 billion. The needs in the world just to achieve the sustainable development goals that the UN set is about three to four trillion a year. So philanthropy, generosity is not going to solve the problem. What we really need are great business people to go out and be a different kind of capitalist where you, you set up this idea that you're both going to have an impact and uh, make a profit, right? Now, you know, um, I, I, you know in my understanding of, of the history of Alibaba, you know, uh, Jack wanted to do something very different. You know, Joe joined in the early days, and they decided that they were going to create a culture and do something that went far beyond making money, right? So that's, I think, what we need more than anything else. And, and for the people who say, well, you know, we're trying not to make a profit, you can do that if you want, but that won't be very long-lasting. Do you, you, you remember social, uh, so, what was it called, the, the um, uh, uh, social investing, remember? That happened, and the returns were so bad, it just went away, right? So we've got to find a way. And I'm not talking about 40 50% uh, you know, IRR. We're talking about a reasonable um, uh, profit that will keep uh, investors interested. You know, uh, BlackRock is looking for 8% gross, 6% net. We can do that. I mean, we can find ways of doing that in developing countries. And, and, and they should also learn about what we do. We have political risk insurance. In other words, you know, we can insure you against the country t you know, nationalizing your industry. We have credit enhancement. If they can't pay, you know, uh, uh, a, um, uh, if they ma can't make payments, we can pay them for you. We have partial risk guarantee with so many different tools. We are now in the business of trying to attract more owners uh, and, uh, and allocators of capital to work with us. But you know, what we hear is people say, oh, it's just too risky, right? They think, they think most people think of Africa as a country. It's not a country, right? It's 50 some countries, and every single country has a different risks. Every sector, every firm has a different level of risk. So keep your business hat on, but come with us and find ways that you can both make a return and uh, do a lot of good in the world. I think you will agree, agree with me, Jim, that uh, Bill Gates is really one of the, probably his, when history is written, will be known as one, one of the greatest philanthropists. It's not just that he got a lot of money, uh, but he used it in such a way that it really can be leveraged uh, uh, to do so much good to society. And I was just in China with Bill Gates, and Bill Gates wanted me to go to a toilet conference, right? So this was a conference in Beijing about toilets, right? And it's so important because, you know, prop, the, a good chunk of the Indian um, uh, stunting is probably due to sanitation and not to, 
to malnutrition. And so Bill got up there on stage and he took a jar of poop and put it on the stand, right? And he talked about how important it, I mean, I'm glad everyone's had their dinner already. <laughs> he, he, he actually put poop on the, on, on the stage. And I went up after Bill and I said, I, can I just say, I, the, 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 the person I want to pay tribute to is the person on Bill's staff who had to put the poop jar together, <laughs> right? But that's what he does, right? So Bill, Bill did his homework and found out that sanitation is so important, so he put his money into building better toilets. I, I think that's amazing. And it's just the way that he is such a student of poverty in all its forms. And, you know, uh, but, but th that's after he made, what, $70 billion, right? A and he can afford to do that. If, those, if there are people who, who, who can afford to look at these problems, that would be really, really great. But also know that Bill just doesn't do his philanthropy. He does things like leverage the World Bank to make his, his philanthropy go even further. I'm very happy to tell you that um, in tomorrow's conference, CAPS conference, Center for Asia Philanthropy and Society, uh, we work quite closely with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In fact, one of the senior staff, the, the, the gentleman who is in charge of the Global uh, Philanthropy Partnership is right here. I don't know if he's the one that put that stuff in the bottle, but ladies and gentlemen, uh, Rob Rosen, why don't you rise to be recognized? Rob Rosen, Robert Rosen. You're not the one, okay. Okay, Joe. Uh, you know, you have made a lot of money too. I don't know if you have 70 billion, but you're, you're into the tens of billions. But whatever it is, whatever it is, uh, you must, you, you have a problem. Your problem is what do you do with the money? <laughs> and, yet, and you're not going to give them all to your children, I, 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 I assume. Uh, I know that Charles and I have, Charles Chen from uh, Tencent and I have had a long, several long discussions on this subject. You know, they have so much money, they're not going to give it to their, all to their children. So what are you going to do with it, and how are you going to, uh, to give it away? You know, don't, don't tell me the simple way of giving to uh, Harvard Chan School and compete with me, okay? But how, how do you propose to use that money to do social good? I, I think people uh, come, come into understanding philo uh, philanthropy with the wrong mindset. Uh, they think about giving the money away. So let me ask you this, if you invest capital, if you're a venture capitalist or a private equity guy, you talk about investing your money away, you're, you're gonna be on top of it. I mean, once you've committed the capital, you're gonna be monitoring, you're gonna be uh, jumping in, you know, into the operations maybe yourself to make sure the thing works. So I completely agree with Jim that people with money you know, successful business people, when they think about philanthropy, they have to think about it as basically another business. They're starting another business. And they have to not only write the check, but also bring the energy and the thought into what they do. Uh, and, and think about how to build a team to execute. So you gotta do the business plan, you gotta have budgets, you gotta have team, train the people to do it. Uh, same, same process that you go through with, with a business. So that's, um, uh, so for me, you know, the question for me is, gee, you know, do I have the energy of doing another business right now while, while I'm like 120% at Alibaba, right? That's really my, my dilemma. Um, but uh, fortunately, uh, uh, my wife, who has a HBS degree, uh, is very, very focused on it, and she's uh, Harvard Business School, um, and Stanford undergrad, and um, very focused on it, and she's hired people, she's hired advisors, and people to study the different areas that she's interested in, uh, and, I, and, and I follow her lead uh, currently. And I, I think, uh, here, here's the thing, I don't think people should make a distinction between business and philanthropy. Uh, if you solve societal problems, you're going to create value. And if you create value, you can actually make money. Okay, so, uh, uh, so, th so for those of you who are too busy, you say, I'm too busy uh, with my own business to think about you know, f spending all this time on philanthropy. You know, ba Bill Gates is semi-retired, so, or he's retired. He has all, all the time in the world. But for those of you who are actually in the business, my advice is go back to your business and look at it yourself and ask yourself, 
Is my business socially responsible? Am I making products and services that are actually solving societal problems? If, if I'm actually making harmful products, maybe I should change. Uh, I mean, not, you know, maybe to give an inappropriate example, making cigarettes. Cigarette companies have to really look at themselves and think about what they're doing. Companies that make, that make guns have to think about what they're doing. So I think, um, you know, I, I, I just think that for those that ha are in the businesses, look at your business yourself. Do a total review and ask yourself, Am I doing, is my business doing something that's socially responsible and creating social value? Well, I'm so happy that, yeah, I'm so happy that uh, my company just, again, won the ESG award uh, just a few days ago. And I don't know, this is the seventh year in a row that we have done that. I know that uh, I, I do have two questions I must ask you guys. And, and nobody's moving, nobody's leaving. So I think we can let it go for another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, technology. Bill Gates says that technology, he, he wonders how come not more smart people think about the negative things about technology. Now, technology, we all know the good that it can bring, but technology can also create a lot of issues. Just AI, I mean, there's just a lot of this debate and discussions on whether at the end of the day, is it positive or, or, or is it something that will destroy so much jobs and what have you that will be really a serious uh, causer of uh, social problems? What's your thoughts, both of you? I think, uh, you know, for example, people say AI is going to take away a lot of jobs and uh, make, uh, uh, you know, people unemployed and all that. Uh, I, I don't think anybody invests in technology or create technology with a purpose or intention of creating social problems. These are the side effects. It's just, I mean, food. If you eat too much food, you have a problem, you know. So, I, you know, I think what what... Uh, the, the people that need to, uh, that, that create, that are innovative, that are creative, that make products that are backed by technology, um, you know, they, I, I just don't think that right now you ought to spend too much time thinking about it uh, because the problems are actually very, very far away. Um, and uh, what technology does is to improve productivity and improve the economy and, 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 and spur economic growth. And the economic growth can, co uh, can cover a lot of the issues right now in society. Well, Jim, is the world that beautiful? There must be some downside. Can you uh, uh, please disagree with, jo uh, with Joe or uh, what, whatever? Well, you know, the, the Luddites, the Luddites were a real social movement that destroyed, um, you know, um, the, the weaving machines because they thought it would eliminate all jobs. You know, um, Karl Marx and others said that, you know, technology is going to eliminate all work. And, of course, they were wrong uh, 150, 200 years ago. And the question is, are they going to be right this time? And what we found is that when we look at the estimates of job losses, for the U.S., for example, the estimates go from 5% to 70%. And for all the countries, the ranges are that large. And so the, I, we came away saying, well, we don't, we don't actually know what's going to happen. But what we do know is the nature of the jobs will change. And we don't know what the number is going to do, but the nature is going to change. And we also know that for sure uh, you, you have to be prepared to deal with these new jobs. It's going to be new skills. We, we, in fact, know it's not just you know, science, technology, engineering, and math, but it's the so-called soft skills. It's the socio-emotional skills. There are different kinds of skills that are going to be required. The biggest thing we found is that for the technology companies that start off thinking about the application of their technology in poor countries, uh, they go in a completely different direction. And so, um, uh, you know, a, a philosopher, um, and I forget his name now, but out of in, in New York City, said that every technology has to have a philosophy. Why do you exist? What are you trying to do? What problem are you trying to solve? And what, what we find is that, and we, our teams have been spending a lot of time in Silicon Valley, uh, the, the philosophy is, I got to make money. Whereas if you start off saying, I got to mo make money, but I also have to do good, like in the case of Alibaba, we have to focus on small and medium enterprises, that you, the philosophy of your technology can take you in a different direction. So for example, one company, 
full of literally rocket scientists, uh, aeronautical engineers, decided that they were going to take their drone company and try to deliver blood in Rwanda. And so they went in a completely different direction. And now every uh, uh, blood is delivered in Rwanda using drones. And they're now, they started in one country. I talked about them so much. They're now in 15 countries. And the philosophy from the beginning was, how can we use drones to solve the most difficult social problems in the poorest countries? That's what I think is, uh, is, uh, is important. OK, well, after the, my next short question, we'll open to the floor, OK? You talk about, Jim, talk about aspiration. Now everybody has a cell phone and hence can see how the rest of the world live. So as ex aspiration explodes. But would, will we be able to meet those expectations or halfway meet those expectations? And what will happen if we don't? What will happen uh, to the people uh, in the poorer parts of the world, uh, from Africa, from the Middle East? Uh, Europe must be scared to death. So, so what are we looking at right here? We have no choice. We have no choice but to try, right? And so, you know, my parents had high aspirations, but because by complete accident, they got scholarships, they came to the United States, they saw how Americans lived. I have no problem with everyone in the world having high aspirations, uh, but we, we have got to focus on it. Now, if you look at the so-called Arab Spring, what happened in Tahrir Square, what happened in Tunisia, it was really a whole bunch of college-educated young people who graduated from college with degrees in philosophy and psychology. They couldn't, the, 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 the schools uh, did not have the ability to teach them STEM. They just didn't have the, the, the faculty uh, who were upset by the fact that they went to college but had no prospects, right? So I think that's, that's a harbinger of things to come. Uh, people who uh, may not have had a good education, may have been stunted as children, will have smartphones and will probably be literate enough to be able to start movements. So, you know, the, I think in some ways that's great because the social pressure on us to focus on inequality and opportunity will become greater with every passing year. And I firmly believe that there are private sector models that you can put into practice right now, bring this money off the sideline, and create these opportunities. Well, Joe, I think you and Jack together founded Alibaba. You may have to work together again to find another model that hopefully will not only make you billions and billions, but also while you do that, uh, you also solve many of the social issues that are facing us today. Well, I, I Keep talking. Sorry. I just wanted to say uh, there's something uh, between uh, before the uh, uh, your presentation, Dr. Kim, we we actually talked, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, off stage. On uh, you're 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 looking at this model of being able to assess credit uh, of uh, you know people and being able to lend up to seventy five hundred, and the critical element is to determine whether they have the entrepreneurial spirit, and which is underlied by this idea of aspiration. Uh, and, and we see this every day in our work uh, when I talk to young people. People with aspiration versus people without aspiration. It's the difference of at least 3x in productivity. And uh, that's something I, I wanted to highlight, I wanted to emphasize. And I think there's a lot that we can do to inspire people uh, to uh, sort of instill that sense of aspiration uh, in young people. Um, and I think with that, economic development will follow. Very good. Thank you. OK, the floor is open. Anybody uh, want to raise a question, please raise your hand, and their microphone will come to you. And hopefully, it will work. And just tell us quickly what you, uh, who you are, and then ask the question, please. This is your few chance that you can have a chance to ask question of Dr. Jim Kim and uh, Joe Chai. Anyone? Including the students at the back? Okay, there's a student at the very, very corner at the back. I assume that there is a student table, maybe not, but anyway, it doesn't matter. I think there's a young lady there. Well, one thing I've learned is that when you come to speak, Ronnie works you hard, man. You can, you bet. Doesn't let you get off the stage. Go ahead. We'll make it short. Please. So my question was, how do you guys actually measure 
what is considered sustainable. Like you say, all these people are lifted out of poverty, but how do you actually measure it? So if you're creating a business, um, for example, like it's a little bit better than using plastic, but it's still not that great. So how do you, where's the line? Like how do you measure it? I'm not really sure the question. How do you measure? So you said companies should ask what they're doing is socially responsible or is okay. having a good impact that. on the environment. So, so, so that's a great question. It? And it's, there's a lot of controversy over it. So you know, we talk about ESG, environment, social, and governance. And there are beginning to be some definitions of it, but it's not clear. So the, for example, impact investing. What is impact investing? Uh, but it goes further than that. You know, um, Andrew, you know, uh, Andrew Steer, who's the audience? We, we have something called green bonds. But what we see is that we uh, see a lot of greenwashing. They call everything a green bond when it's not really green, uh, but they think it's going to help them in the marketing uh, of the bond. Impact investing, we see a lot of people talking about it, but there's, there's not a definition. So at, at, at IFC, our, our private sector group, we're now creating a uh, framework for how you measure impact. So we've begun to measure the impact of every one of our projects, right? Uh, we've been doing it on the public sector side for quite some time. And so um, uh, it, it falls to multilateral organizations that are run by all the countries that, to come up with some kind of definition. So we're trying to do that right now. What is ESG? What is impact investing? What's a real green bond? Uh, because you know, it shouldn't be used just to market. It should be something real. I'm a little worried because my company just issued the very, very first green panda bond in the world. But anyway, okay, uh, with the, okay, uh, anybody else? At the very back, is there a hand? Yeah, please raise your hand higher. Yeah, that's the same table, please. I assume they are students, please. Um, are you a student? Yes, yes. What university? Uh, Hong Kong U. Huh? University of Hong Kong. Very good. Please. <laughs> uh, so you touched upon, Dr. Jim, you touched upon this a little uh, when you talked about um, uh, equality of access. But uh, my question is, uh, how would you tackle poverty in the developed world that lacks, uh, with the race, sorry, that already has uh, the infrastructure, uh, the, the mechanisms to promote resilience, and the investment in, in human capital? Well, um, you know, we don't actually work in developed countries. Um, but... I've talked to a lot of legislators in developed countries, and we've offered to give them our, all of our experience because we think there are tremendous numbers of fantastic examples in developing countries. Just for example, childhood stunting. Uh, Peru struggled, and I, I worked in Peru for many years, struggled with 30% childhood stunting for three decades. And then finally, they put a program in place uh, that was innovative, and they reduced their stunting level in half in six years, right? So uh, are there lessons? We're now taking the Peru example and taking it to India, Indonesia, to Pakistan, Africa, everywhere in the world. And so that's what we do. Now, most developed countries don't ask for our advice, right? But I, I frankly think that we have a lot of good examples. Let me give you one example, right? Conditional cash transfers, right? Giving money directly to poor people, but then conditioning the next payment on sp certain specific things. Their kids stay in school, the kids are well nourished, they learn about public health. Turns out learning, teaching poor people about public health is really important in terms of their overall well-being. Uh, and it not only, not only does it uh, uh, help the way that they live their own lives, right? but it actually is an economic boost because poor people, when you give them cash, they spend it. Right? So, uh, could conditional cash transfer programs work in, in developed countries? Well, some developed countries have the equivalent, like the Nordic countries and others, but some don't. And so we think it, it, you know, if any developed country asked my advice, I would have a lot of it. No more? Okay, over there. Wow, certainly now everybody's raising their hand. I can only take no more than two more, okay? That one, and then uh, Michael Gallagher in the front, and then we'll have to call it quit. Yeah, please. The mic is not working. Hi, uh, uh, 
I'm a high school student, and I was wondering what is an uh, important skill or quality I could implement from now on in my life to uh, in this digital world. Can you repeat it? What skill? What skill? A skill or uh, ability, quality that I should implement in my life in this digital world. Joe, well, uh, let me just start by saying, you know, things like uh, being collaborative, having empathy, being able to work with others, uh, um, being knowing how to communicate with others, knowing how to listen. It turns out that those skills are so much more important than we ever thought, uh, and and you can actually link those the existence of those skills to economic performance, right? So it, it's not something I ever would have believed. And so now every time I say soft skills, someone in our organization wants to slap me because they're not so soft, right? So um, you, know, you should tackle the field that you're passionate about, whether it's you know, computer science or history or whatever it happens to be. But then you, you also have to think about you know, how can I get better at working uh, with others. You know, in the United States, up until grade school, they give you a grade for works and plays well with others. You get a grade for that up and through grade school. And then they stop giving it. It turns out that's a mistake. We should have given that grade all the way through college because it turns out to be very predictive of people who are going to be successful. Joe, oh, it seems like much. Dr. Kim was describing you. And that's why you're so successful. Tell us. I agree, uh, but you know, in our company, uh, we very much focus on EQ uh, because in a collaborative environment, you have to convince somebody else uh, to do something. Even if you're the boss, you can't just give orders. You have to be persuasive, and that's where EQ comes into play. And I think the world is moving toward a, 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 a stage where uh, people are going to collaborate. Uh, nobody is going to com uh, monopolize all the resources. The resources are going to come from everywhere. And uh, so collaboration in the future world is going to be more important. And, and EQ is the critical element. Um, and uh, I, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, there's no school where you can go to get EQ. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, you have to spend a lot of time with your friends and also care about your families. Um, think about every relationship, every human relationship, as an opportunity uh, to develop your EQ. Let me tell you, Joe takes care of his family. Last time, he and I had Korean food in Orange County, California, and he drove all the way up from San Diego because his family was there, and he drove right back right after we had lunch. Okay, last question, Michael Gallagher. Yes, um, I think the, uh, the panel has collaborated very well uh, sharing the microphones, uh, I'd like to, like to point work. that out, teamwork. Um, I'd appreciate any comment you have about the severity of climate change and the predictions that we've heard in the past few weeks about uh, the estimates were wrong uh, and the, the climate is deteriorating faster than uh, experts had thought and there's 10 to 12 years to seriously make major changes, yeah. what, uh, what does your crystal ball say about whether or not humanity is going to uh, do, what, do what's necessary? So let me call an audible and ask Andrew. Andrew Steer is one, Andrew of, the Steer. World, Andrew is one of the world experts on right. this. Right? He actually brought climate change issues to the World Bank Group, right, uh, and then left. And I, I, so let me add, I think I am, I am desperately afraid of this, right? And so I have a nine-year-old son, right? And uh, every time he's, he, he sees a show, I mean, it, it, Andrew, will, you know, we, we went from very, doing very little in climate change uh, now that it's 30% of our portfolio. And we did, we did 20 billion last year, and we're going to go to 40 billion a year. But it's not going to touch uh, what, what, what the need is. My nine-year-old son says to me all the time when he sees a television show, he says, Dad, why aren't you doing more about climate change, right? He's right, Andrew. I'd love to just hear. Please. Speak well, first, up. this has been a, a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Jim, uh, you made an announcement last week on behalf of the World Bank, which is really, you know, leading others to follow. Thank you for doing that. I just got off the plane from um, Poland, where the uh, the the annual climate negotiations are going on, 
and we are not where we need to be. The Paris deal is a good deal, it's a very good deal, but each year we need to do better. This year it is pretty tough to really lock in further progress. Last month, the uh, International Panel on Climate Change came out with a new report showing that even with a 1.5 degree Celsius increase, we will lose 60% of all the coral reefs. And we already have more than one degree. It's not without hope, <laughs> but we do need a kind of radical rethinking, precisely the kind that you three have been talking about there today. Incremental change will not get us to where we need to get. We need to think about change that is really disruptive. And the good news, and Jim, you've done, you've done work on this, and actually <laughs> Joe at Alibaba, you also have demonstrated this, that actually we can have the radical change, and actually it won't hurt our economy. It will actually open entirely new avenues that are exciting, that will promote jobs and technology and competitiveness, and, and life will be better but it requires a leadership that we're seeing on the stage right now, but we're not seeing enough in the world. Well, thank you, Andrew, for flying all the way here. <laughs> Mr. Steer, Mr. Steer will be addressing a group of uh, philanthropists tomorrow morning. I'm sure that the world will become a better place after you speak to them. Anyway, every one of you have a bag. Take it home. Inside is a catalog of one of the most successful exhibitions that the A Society of Hong Kong has ever done. It is a show by uh, Yoshitomo Nara. Many of you know, uh, one of the most famous living Japanese artists. All you get is a book, the catalog. But for our two speakers, they get something else. Mr. Nara produced uh, a set of plates uniquely for the Asia Society uh, for our exhibition. And we sold them very cheap. $888, uh, I think, at the beginning, and we only made a 1,000 set of it. Uh, and people line up from 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. in the morning uh, until uh, 9 a.m. or whatever when we begin to sell, sell them. Well, we still have a few sets left at the Asia Society. And I was told that at the, at the Internet, uh, uh, yeah, uh, they were selling something like twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 per set. So value has gone up. So Asia Society... Too bad that we didn't get the benefit from it, uh, but nonetheless, we're so happy that we still have two sets here for our two speakers. Jim, you want to add something? I was going to. I'm going to say, ask Joe if I could sell mine on Alibaba. <laughs> Absolutely, you can. But you know what? What you should do is to keep the boxes and reuse it. Oh. Well, on the condition, Joe, that you will sell it for Dr. Kim if the money goes to Asia Society. Is that agreed? <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, another round of big applause for our two great speakers today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the world has, been, it has become a slightly better place because of the good work of Jim Kim. We're looking forward to the next one, who may be one of those young, young person in Africa somewhere. Maybe he or she will one day succeed Dr. Kim. I also want to thank... Uh, Mrs. Karen Lam, our chief executive, thank you very much for gracing us with your presence. I know that you're very busy. Thank you very much, Gary. <laughs>